Hi everybody, in this video tutorial, I'm going to walk you through four of the major endocrine axes found within humans and other vertebrates. While these endocrine axes do not incorporate all the hormones found within your body, they are perhaps four of the most important endocrine responses in the fact that they deal with the well-being of your everyday life. Specifically, they're going to deal with energy release, the stress response, growth, and reproduction. All these axes are called hypothalamopituitary axes because they deal with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So let's jump in to the first axis. And the first axis we're gonna focus on is the hypothalamo-pituitary thyroid axis because it deals with hypothalamus influencing the anterior pituitary gland which will influence the thyroid gland. So the first hormone released is thyrotropin releasing hormone. Now, anytime that you see the word tropin it is implying that that hormone is going to stimulate the production and release of another hormone. And that's what TRH does. Upon entering the hypothalamic pituitary portal system, it will flow to the pituitary gland, where it will stimulate the release of TSH from thyrotrophs. Thyrotrophs are specific clusters of cells that are responsible in producing TSH. TSH will enter the bloodstream and go and target the thyroid gland and the thyroid gland will then produce T3 or thyroxine and T4. Now both these thyroid hormones will have very similar effects to each other but T3 which has three iodines is a much more potent hormone than T4 which has four iodines. So the biggest effect that these thyroid hormones will do increased basal metabolic rate. Now when you increase basal metabolic rate, you're increasing your energy expenditure, which will result in increased heat production. And this heat that is produced as a result is what will allow us to keep such a high body temperature. So here you're increasing the energetic expenditure. You're increasing the amount of energy that is released and can be used for various processes. So naturally, what's going to come with this is a decreased uptake of glucose. Because you're not trying to take glucose and store it away, you're trying to take glucose and keep it out in the bloodstream so it can be used for physiological processes. So all of this is really all about energy release and this energy release is going to be used to fuel so many different processes throughout the body now virtually every tissue in your body has receptors for t3 and t4 so therefore you can get the effects of these hormones in multitude of tissues so for example these hormones will cause the increased energy release thus allowing for skeletal muscle contraction skeletal muscle growth, bone growth, the stress response, neural growth, which would involve learning, storing away of memories. So as we go through, what you're going to see with the next few axes is, as, is that this HPT axis will help fuel and provide the energy for these other axes to have their maximum effects. So let's move on to the second axis. The second axis we'll talk about is the HPA axis, which will start with corticotropin-releasing hormone, which will stimulate the anterior pituitary gland and corticotrophs to release ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which will then go and target the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands will secrete glucocorticoids, now the main glucocorticoid in humans and some other mammals is cortisol. Corticosterone is another glucocorticoid that is found in even more animals out there. Now the main impact of these glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, is to increase catabolic reactions. Now catabolic reactions means breaking down macromolecules. So here, the things that you are breaking down will include lipids into fatty acids, 
you're breaking down proteins into amino acids, and you're breaking down glycogen into glucose. Now all of these, when you break glycogen and glucose, that's wonderful because you have glucose that can be now be used for energy. For lipids and proteins, you use the amino acids and fatty acids, and you use that to make new glucose, which is a process called gluconeogenesis. So all in all, what this axis is dealing with is increasing the amount of energy available within the bloodstream. And that's going to be really important because that is going to help fuel skeletal muscle contractions at a higher rate, higher rate of heart contractions, and it's ultimately going to help fuel the stress response. This whole axis is really the stress response or fight or flight, which will involve you fighting or dealing with a potential stressor or escaping that stressor. And the only way you could do either of those options is if you have significant energy available for you. So here, when you look at the HPT and HPA axis combined, it really is all about increasing the amount of energy available to your tissues. So when you put these two together, you can get a maximal response. So here we've gone through two of the four axes. Moving on into the third one, and the third axis cannot occur without the HPT axis and the energy provided by that axis. This is called the HPS axis, or hypothalamo-pituitary-somatotropic axis. And this is going to be, in other words, called the growth axis. So this is going to start with growth hormone, releasing hormone being produced from the hypothalamus. Now, what growth hormone releasing hormone is going to do is it will go on, enter the hypothalamic pituitary portal system, and activate somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland. And somatotrophs will release growth hormone. Now, this is one of the big differences here between the other axes, and that is the fact that at the anterior pituitary gland, there is not a stimulating hormone that is released. What is released instead is the end hormone, and the end hormone here being growth hormone. So growth hormone will then go on and go to a target organ. Now growth hormone has several target organs. It'll include the liver, which is a major one. It will include muscle, and it will include bone. Now here, what's gonna happen with these three tissues will be the increased expression and production of IGF. IGF-1 and IGF-2. So I'll put both of them on there. And these are called insulin-like growth factors. And as their name suggests, insulin-like growth factors, they're going to be similar to insulin in structure, and they're going to stimulate growth. So growth, when produced by the muscle, it is going to act locally. So IGFs will increase muscle mass, or hypertrophy. When produced by bone, it is going to act locally and increase bone growth. So early on in life before puberty, increase in bone length. Now once you hit puberty, it's not going to make your bones grow longer, but it's going to increase bone remodeling or bone density. When they're produced by the liver, IGFs, IGS will circulate throughout the rest of the body and stimulate more neural growth, more muscle growth, more bone growth. All in all, it is all about growth here. So growth hormone 
in its in its own does not directly stimulate growth, but it stimulates growth through the effects of IGF. And the only way that you can fuel the expensive processes of growth is if you have activation of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So in other words, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis needs to be activated to release all this energy and make it available for growth to occur, for muscles to grow, for bones to grow, for um, neural tissue to grow. All right, let's finish with the last axis here. And the last axis will be the hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis. It deals with the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the gonads, be it the ovaries or testes, depending on what sex you are. So the first hormone released is going to be gonadotropic releasing hormone. It is another tropin hormone that will go to the anterior pituitary gland and stimulate the production and release of two hormones by gonadotrophs. Luteinizing hormone will be one and follicle stimulating hormone will be the other. And then from here, it's going to flow down both of these to the gonads. And the effects of these two hormones will be different depending on whether or not you are male or female. So what it's going to cause, so we'll start with males. So for males, luteinizing hormone will cause the increased production and release of testosterone. And testosterone will have a multitude of effects within males. It'll increase male reproductive behaviors, um, aggression. It's going to stimulate increased production of sperm as well. Testosterone will increase the creation of red blood cells, hence why males will have higher hematocrits. It's going to increase bone mass, muscle mass. So testosterone really is going to be what drives most of what makes males different than females. In females, what luteinizing hormone will do is it's going to cause ovulation. So the release of a secondary oocyte in the oviduct for a possible fertilization. So that's what luteinizing hormone is going to do. And it targets cells within the testes or the ovaries. What about follicle stimulating hormone? So I'll extend follicle stimulating hormone down here and I'll go through ovulation here. Follicle stimulating hormone for males, that's going to increase sperm production or spermatogenesis. Follicle stimulating hormone in females will stimulate follicle creation or folliculogenesis, which is what the oocyte will develop within during the ovarian cycle. The other thing that follicle stimulating hormone will initiate relatively indirectly through folliculogenesis is increased estradiol production, which will give females their behaviors and their um, typical physical characteristics and it'll also increase the production of progesterone which is what will maintain pregnancy or maintain the uterine cycle up until menstruation and similar to the HPS axis much of what is going on within that HPG axis takes a lot of energy and the main way that you can fuel these expensive reproductive processes is if you have the HPT axis activated as well. So all together, when you look at the HPG axis, the main focus there is reproduction. 
So in summary, we have the four major endocrine axes, the HPT axis, HPA axis, HPS axis, and HBG axis. They all start with the hypothalamus. They all then will have the anterior pituitary gland in the middle, and then they will, they will all have specific target organs. And these are going to be really dealing with the overall survival and reproduction of a particular individual organism.